Hello everyone, welcome back to Wish Creative Conversations. Today I had the chance to talk to Tim Davis. He is a producer at New City Players, which is a theater production company in South Florida, and he also runs One County Film Company, uh, which is a feature film narrative uh, company and Stone Circle Media. The man does a lot. Uh, but we wanted to have a little conversation with him regarding producing and first ADing and set management. Anyway, he was my first AD for Three Bedrooms, and I also had the privilege of working with him in uh, One County's uh, Pomp and a Boy set. Uh, I was sound engineering, and he was first ADing, producing, and he was also part of the cast. Uh, we just had a conversation about micro budget filmmaking. Uh, how to go out and get the courage to make your film, uh, what this landscape of film looks like. And anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right, so welcome back to Conversations. And today I have with me Tim Davis. Tim, you, you do a lot. I, I wanted to give, like, I, wanted, I was writing a nice introduction about who you are, but I feel like you do a lot. <laughs> so why don't you explain all the... 10 companies you own and all the things you do. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I think the title that probably best encompasses what I do is producer and kind of works at a few, a few different levels. So I work for a theater company called New City Players where I'm the producing artistic director. And primarily in that space, I am... Uh, marketing and raising funds and choosing seasons and hiring talent and acting uh, every now and then when I can. And then for second company, it's a video production company, Stone Circle Media, I am project managing, um, kind of dealing directly with the clients. I'm the liaison between the videographers and editors and the client. So trying basically being that middle middleman, middle person to make communication clean and clear and drawing up contracts and uh, also working on business development, getting new clients. So, and then one County film company, which is uh, Andrew, my brother and I, our film company, uh, which is, it's the same thing as the video production company. It's just uh, stone circles, a DBA for one County. And so for that, I produced our last feature film that we did and, you know, we'll kind of be transition as Andrew's editing, I'll be transitioning into thinking about distribution and marketing and all that kind of stuff as well. So yeah, it's a lot of hiring people, managing people, making sure projects happen, making sure there's money in all of the different spaces. So similar jobs, but in different companies different yeah different things that each company does um what so i we finished filming pomp and a boy which is your second feature film like a little bit over a month ago which seems yeah. crazy i know <laughs> uh, so long ago but yeah uh before that it so you kind of got involved with the film game in the weirdest manner possible <laughs> like i feel like andrew so andrew your brother made palace which is the first one county film um, and you didn't have much to do with that until True West happened, which was the New City Players play. And then you decided to start one, one county. Uh, so Palace almost got adopted that way. Yeah. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. The first, your first feature film was ended up being Three Bedrooms, which is Wish Creative's first feature film, where um, you know I came I came to Andrew and I was like, hey, do do you want to partner? Do you want to make this a one county? slash wish creative endeavor uh and so we went through this whole like six month process where we were analyzing what you could end up doing and, and you ended up helping us uh both producing and with the first ada mm -hmm. so you just kind of got thrown in that world yeah. but now you've done two features because you were in three bedrooms doing the first ad and then you were the first ad plus you were talent in pomp and a boy so coming from that place of, you know, you're, you're not really, you didn't go to film school. You're no. just kind of thrown in this. No. Um, 
I'm a theater person. I'm not a film person by training mm-hmm. and trade. Right. Yeah. Um, what was that experience first ADing? Uh, just, I mean, it's such a, it's such a, it's such a big role too. It's, it's like one that requires knowing films and knowing what the film set really runs like, and you just got <laughs> throw it in there. Uh, what was that yeah. like? Um, you know, for for three bedrooms, it was to me a, a huge part of wanting to partner with you in that and deciding to help with that was like, this will be great. This this will be great experience for me personally to be on set in a production capacity and not just in an acting capacity. Um, Because I mean, I've acted in several of Andrew's short films and acted in some other short films as well. And I did some background actor work on a big production that came through Miami a couple of years ago. So kind of familiar with film sets from the actor standpoint. Uh, but on the, on the production side of things, the producing side of things, not as much at all. And so it was kind of like, you know, I'm, I think I'm just, a am a person who like, I, I have a strong sense of what my abilities are. Mm-hmm just sort of my soft skills and I can see like, okay, this is how I can fit in to a project and this is what I can do. And this is what I absolutely cannot do. So other people need to do it. I need to Mm -hmm. either staff that out or hire someone else or beg someone to do it for free or whatever it is. And I just always felt like the first AD role kind of captured some skills that I have just in terms of getting, getting shit done. You know, I just like, yeah, I just like have that kind of drive to push things forward and not really want to wait around for permission from other people. You know, that's been kind of my own artistic entrepreneurial philosophy is don't wait for someone to give you permission to work, make your own right. work. You know, right. I've done that in the theater for the last five years. That's opened up different opportunities to work for other people uh, because of taking on a company myself. And we're doing it with the film as well. So I was definitely nervous because I'm like, what experience do I have? What do I what do I bring to this outside of the um, kind of personality traits that I think could fit this role? And the answer is not much. (laughs) And so I did some, you know, I did some research and watched some YouTube videos and did some reading and uh, just kind of like gleaned as much as I could that you can from watching other people do it or listening to other people's advice, but there's no experience like actually doing it. So I feel like I yeah. learned, learned some things on the, on the three bedroom set. And originally for Papa no boy, I, I mean, I kind of told Andrew, I was like, I don't think I can produce first AD and act in this film. Like it's yeah. just, it's just too much. I think we need to get someone else to first AD and he kind of like didn't respond. <laughs> he just kind of like, you know, did what Andrew does, well, yeah. not the talk, interface. but yeah. communicate a lot. <laughs> and I thought about it for like 10 minutes and I was like, you know what? Forget it. I'll just do it. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it'll be because of the nature of the production, it'll be easier for me to just kind of mesh the producer first AD role and kind of just push this project forward at the macro and at right. the at the micro. And I think what I what I completely lack in technical skill or knowledge or filmmaking technique, um, I think I make up for in uh, curiosity mm-hmm. and uh, appreciation and passion and um, people personality management. Right. Um, and just kind of like pushing something forward, pushing the team forward. So, I also feel like in the mic in the micro budget um, arena, or it could be like the no budget arena, mm-hmm. the place where we work, where we don't have money but we want to make films. Right. Uh, it, it's not as necessary to have the like a huge first AD who's gonna, um, you know, uh, have been on set before because I feel like. Right that could almost be a hindrance, you know, because yeah. we, we we are working on a space where 
not everything can be the way that Hollywood does it, and we don't right. we don't try to replicate that. So that right. even innocence and ended up helping. I feel like it's <laughs> just like sure. hey, let's go, you know, and um, not really worry about the technicalities and the even though you know with with SAG we did have to like keep a schedule and all these things. Just right. meeting those guidelines, I think, helped. So um, so yeah, that's really interesting that uh, you were first dating out of the get go. Uh, what about the producing part? Um, specifically, what do you think the hardest thing that's not money, so non-financial, because obviously the money is, it's always uh, there, yeah. you know, like it's always going to be a problem. Right. Uh, what about uh, the producing part? Do you, did you find that you had to, that was hard that you had to overcome, uh, especially in the micro budget arena? Mm-hmm. Um, I think... It was, it was a really interesting experience, you know, because I come from producing theater, which is significantly easier than producing film. Really? Uh, yeah. I, or, and maybe that's just because that's my background. And so it yeah. just seems easier. Um, I, th I think the, the, yeah, I think the most challenging thing is the personality management. You know, I think we were really... Mm -hmm. We were really fortunate that 98% yeah. of the people who worked on this film were just like great to work with. Right. You know, really giving and uh, just like chill people. Mm -hmm. But the other 2% made for some challenging moments and difficult times. And in both films, in both films, I think. That in was, both yeah. films. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I think I definitely, you know, in three bedrooms, it was sort of like you were you were producing that film, you know, mm -hmm. you produced that film, you made that film happen and directed it. Andrew and I came in for production and helped on the ground, and we helped with the script ahead of time some, but that was really your project. So like, the the personality management fell on you, you know, ultimately. Yeah. For Papano Boy totally goes back to me you know it was my um prerogative to manage that stuff and i absolutely made some mistakes and uh, did some things that i regret <laughs> in retrospect but i i just feel like i learned so, like i i just have like a, a note on my computer now that's like things to know for producing next time and it's those types of things that like the only way i would have found out about this is by doing it the wrong way and a lot right. of it's just like the order of things like, oh, I should have done this before I did this. That would have made mm -hmm. the paperwork process smoother and easier. Some of those weird details that would help. Uh, but, but honestly, it's like, to some degree, it's not, it's not rocket science. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like organization. Like that is the main thing is like, do we have the right people in the right place at the right time? You know, and if you, can check all those boxes for each day of production. That's pretty much all it is. So it's like mm -hmm. having that mind that is thinking ahead, but also thinking in the moment. And some things I just got out of order and it made for some challenging uh, producing things and paperwork mm -hmm. things and having to go over things again. Um, but I learned it for next time. Is there a system that you want to implement next time? Like, is there like, some weird hack with like binders, checklists, mm. something that you think you might want to implement next time you, you, you're trying to get all the people in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a huge thing of producing. It's like so many things could fall through the cracks because there's just so much going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I think for three bedrooms, like I think the week before shooting is when I really started paying attention, to, uh, paying attention to the catering, and I was like, oh, I actually don't have a plan for that, and people have to eat, and I did have a budget for it because I was like, I, I know I need to pay for it, but actually going through the systems of like, you know, things as stupid as like who's gonna drive to the place and pick up the food and how are they gonna pay for it. Like, it's so stupid, but oh, yeah. it, it still needs to be accounted for. Yeah, I think the thing 
the biggest the biggest change for next time is there has to be more space between when the script is locked and when we start production because mm. I was finding that it's it's just really difficult to go down any particular path until the script is locked you right. know it's like the shoot schedule <laughs> the script breakdown the shoot schedule the locations like those things just can't happen until the script is is locked finalized yeah and um the challenge that i found is like okay now we have a month to do a lot of these things and i just sort of realized i can't do all of this and and the catering that was the piece that i was like okay maloney mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to be on set but you can facilitate people bringing food you can purchase food and we can pick it up so i just totally delegated all of that to him um, while still, you know, the day before always checking in and being like, what's food tomorrow? What do we need to do? What can I pick up? Mm. And then the other thing was like a week before we started shooting, just the recognition as I was looking at like each day's schedule and realizing there are multiple times where for me to accomplish what needs to happen, I would need to be in two places at once. Right. <laughs> and I was like that. I need an assistant or a second AD or someone. And that's when I called Alex and was like, mm. and to me, it didn't even need to be a person who had film experience, just needed right. to be someone who was available. And I knew that Alex had some flexibility and just made the decision to a week out, hey, we'll hire you. Well, we got to spend the money to hire you because I need you to be a runner. I need you to go pick people up. I need you to go pick food up. I need you to drive people around. You know, it's just like that type of stuff. Running errands, yeah. That I didn't plan for ahead of time that really snuck up on me as I started looking closer at the shoot schedule and the different needs. And um, I think some of that would smooth out with just more time before uh, production started. So, so now that you've done these two films, how, how do you run a set? What is your philosophy for running a set? Is there, is there such a thing as that? Like, or are, is there some things you're more focused on than others? And, and how does one go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think I... I mean, in one sense, I have no idea. You know, it's just like winging it. I think in another sense, this sort of emerged on the set of of Pompano Boy, this idea that watching the different departments work from what the director's doing to the actors, sound, lights, camera, uh, art direction, food, uh, just kind of like seeing all of those things try to happen at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, just this like idea emerged and it really came out of it came, it was inspired by some of the personality management crisis that we mm -hmm. had uh, working with someone who was so only concerned with their own job their own path the results of their own contribution to the art uh, it was so deplorable to witness someone okay. be so utterly self-centered <laughs> in a art form that is completely collaborative. Right. Um, and so it's just this recognition that like everyone, every department kind of needs to think that every other department is more important than them. So right. actors need to always think that the writer is way more important than them. Mm -hmm. Directors need to think that the actors are more important than them. Yeah. Sound needs to think that lighting's more important. Lighting needs to think that sound's more important. And like, all of a sudden you realize if everyone is thinking about everyone else, you know, obviously doing their job and hitting their marks, you got to deliver on your own stuff. But if you're approaching it with like, I got to make sure that what I'm doing is serving the whole picture and serving uh -huh. this other department, you realize that like everyone has each other's backs. So not everyone has to be so protective of what they're doing and so obsessed with themselves. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's particularly for the actors, the more self-absorbed you are, the less magnetic your performance is going to be. You know, the less you are focused on your fellow actor in the scene uh, or on the text or on, you know, 
creating different options for the director and editor to have at a later time. So that's something that I think philosophically, it's like everyone, and this comes from the theater a lot as well. It's like we serve the play in the theater and film is there's, there's way less respect for the script than in the theater because hmm. uh, the script kind of gets chopped up and the director yep. can do a lot of things and the director changes things on the spot, especially right. when the writer and the director are the same person, you know, they kind of, their director brain takes over and they kind of disregard some of the things that maybe they decided to do as a writer that never hmm. happens in a theater. You know, right. the writer sits at the top of the food chain. Um, but Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. Well, I feel like it, it's it's really dangerous, especially for the people up the top. It could it could happen to the director too, and I feel like it almost never happens in the bottom. You know, where like a PA yeah. is so self. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe <laughs> you get a film school graduate in there. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> but um, it it is a, a dangerous thing. I I also witnessed that on my you know in my own set where it it's just weird where the people who perform the best are the ones who are thinking of themselves the least. Yep. Um, and so having that humility, I think, plays a huge part. So would you say like for hiring from now on, it's like almost 100 percent, not 100 percent, but really looking at personality as opposed to looking at talent? Is that something that you're really going to be wary of um, in the future? Because like that's something that I'm like starting to really think. It's like yeah. bringing strangers or people you don't know. And you can't really you don't know how they work. Right. Uh, that's like a, it, it could be a, a, a stumbling block. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge, that is a huge part of kind of maturing as a, a professional, especially someone who's leading projects. And I, I've had the same problems in the theater before where it's like, oh, I should have done some, I should have done some research and some digging on this person before I hired them. Um, so I definitely think moving forward, um, again, it's a time, it's always a time thing. You know, it's like, am I going to take mm -hmm. the extra 30 minutes to find people who this person has worked with and track mm -hmm. down their contact information and call them or email them and be like, and then it's also like, who's to say that someone they've worked with before isn't terrible, right. you know? So there's always this like game that you play. Uh, and you're taking a risk when you're bringing on someone who you don't know. And I think also an interview process might be something to be incorporated as well. You know, every other job has an interview process. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Elliot Kazan didn't even have auditions. He would just take actors to coffee for three hours and talk to them and then decide if he wanted to hire them. Um, who has time for that besides... Uh, people who have millions of dollars and can, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And are yeah in pre-production for years. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a strategy moving forward is how do I, how do I properly vet people, whether through having conversations with them and looking mm -hmm. for red flags, because everyone's putting on their best, their best act when they're in an interview process anyway. So it's like, no matter what you do, there's always a risk. Right. Uh, I almost think it's, connected with the work on the front end is having a contingency plan for, all right, if this person totally blows up the set or totally bombs or totally tanks, mm. do I have a backup plan that I could pivot to in a couple hours or in 12 hours? Uh, and sometimes at the mic, at our level, you just don't, you know, like it's just not possible to cover all those bases. And you really are taking a risk of, we're going to make this thing, we're going to make this thing and hope that no one is a disaster. Right. Because if they are, it could tank the whole project. So. Well, that's why I feel like in film, it's, especially in our, in our budget range, it's important to be able to change the script at any given moment. Uh, I mean, I'm sure at some point you were maybe even thinking like, okay, can we make this whole film by taking a character out oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the sure. middle of a shooting and just like making those calculations or, sure. you know, if you also run the risk of, you know, since you're not paying people 
or someone gets in an emergency like happened to me uh, during filming, what, what, you know, you need to like think about how you can change the aspects of locations or scenes or lines or yeah. just rethinking that. So yeah. um, that's, that's maybe why film is so versatile, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, and that, and that seems to happen just from legends and lore that happens at all levels of filmmaking, right. you know, characters are totally cut out or things are changed on the day of new scenes are written lines right. are lines are changed. It doesn't matter if your budget's a thousand dollars or 300 million. Mm -hmm. that's happening all the time for all kinds of different reasons. So right. but yeah, it is fle a flexible. The text is very flexible. <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel like it's really important for first time directors to understand that because I feel like people who might've not making short films is, is, is like making a feature, but like in a, in a smaller level. So like there's way more control but I feel for, for someone who's trying to make a feature, it's so important to be willing to let go a little bit, you know, like come in, come into set, like knowing things might change because it could be, if you have the mindset that this is your film and you're trying to be like Stanley Kubrick where everything has to be perfect in the way I want it, right. um, you might have a bad ride. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might have a mad, bad time uh, filming the feature. Um, so, uh what would you say to people who are trying or on the fence of maybe making a micro budget feature? Like, is there any sort of advice, anything that you would say like, Hey, make sure you focus on this. Any blind spots you might want to point out to people who, who again, want to, want to make that first feature. Um, and, but again, they might not even know that they have the resources to do it, or they're too afraid that because it's such a big project, um, they don't want to, go for it until certain parameters are established. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is write a story that you can produce. Uh, you know, and your film is a perfect example of this. Uh, our film is an example of this on a little more complicated scale, but it's like mm -hmm. we, we wrote something that because of our personal connections and favors we could call in and people who so support what we do, we knew we could get those locations or mm. get those certain aspects of the film. Um, if you really want to make a film, then write a film that you can make, you know, don't write something that is going to require 50 grand in VFX or, right. you know, you got to be on a cruise ship for half of the movie or, you know, write, write something that you can actually produce, even if it is like in one house the whole time and it's 70, 80 minutes, um, do it if you want to make a film. Um, if you're, if that's like below you and you're trying to like work up the ladder or, you know, you don't want to make, you don't want to make a film until you can make your five, you know, half a million dollar film or your $2 million film. Uh, then I would say, I don't know. It seems like the short film ladder then <laughs> yeah. try, try, trying to like make that short film. That's $10,000 and or $30,000. And it's like your proof of concept for the bigger film. I just, I'm just like bored by that route. You know, like I just don't want to make, I have no interest in making short films. <laughs> I'd much rather write write something or produce something that is producible and within our budget range. And can actually return some money back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I've been having that conversation with myself lately. Um, because a year ago, I was like, only make features. Now I'm like, I kind of want to make a short just because making a feature is such a big commitment. So maybe like... I think uh, even Andrew did that with uh, Honey River, like right after shooting Palace, he was like, yeah. I want to make a, a short. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do agree that shorts are marketing material. They are, uh, they're, they're, they're meant, I think, for you to learn. That's why like so many uh, film students are going the short film route because you have to start okay. small. But uh, the big, the big thing, like your uh, the thing that you want out out there in festivals and you want 
to make money is going to be a feature film. But I like I totally agree with you that it's about seeing what you have and then writing from there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to make your life so much easier. And I like I I suggest like if that being your first one gives you the whole experience. Like now that we have feature films under our belt, we have more of a we are more prone to actually go out and uh, and and maybe like up the up the game, you know, mm-hmm. if we want to like race the budget or do something a little bit more interesting, at least we feel confident that we've had the experience yeah. uh, to actually go ahead and, and, and jump on a little big, bigger set. Um, cool. So, uh, where, what's going to happen with Pompadour Boy? Where can people find you? Uh, and, and yeah, if people want to check out one County, uh, new seated players and, even people who might be listening to this who have a business and you know might want to jump on a on a video, uh, where, where can we find you? So many places. Uh, I would say, <laughs> I mean, you can you can email me at tim at onecountyfilm.com. Uh, I'm you can message me on LinkedIn because that kind of like captures all the things I'm doing. It's what you know my presence on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, all of those things have Facebook pages and Instagrams and, uh, they are at new city players at one County film at stone circle media in terms of Pompano boy, uh, <laughs> um, it, it, Andrew has not started editing still, <laughs> which is just like very classic Andrew. You know, as soon as we wrapped, we had some, we had some work to do on the video production side. We had some right. catch up to do. Uh, we had some, we were waiting on money to come in. We were co- finalizing contracts for certain work. You know, there was like yeah. things that even while in production, we were slipping over and trying to keep some video production stuff going. Uh, but we had some catch up to do as soon as we wrapped. And so we've kind of just gotten over that hump in the last week where we are, um, current and we've paid everyone who worked on the film and we had some money come in from stuff and you know sort of cash flow is stabilized and we hired a part-time editor to to help bear some of the the work the workflow that was coming in and so now that that has happened i'm kind of like all right andrew (laughs) you know like are you gonna edit this thing or not because i think part of him is just you know, I think this project took a toll on both of us in a, yeah. in a lot of different ways, just personally, professionally. You know, there are aspects of it that were just totally demoralizing. They're so encouraging. Uh, a big part of it just being the team that we worked with. You know, you, right. you and Abby and Chris, Chris and Jay and Joe and Alex and just like the, the production team. Yeah, uh, It was just like a really easy, fun experience, you know. Everyone did their job. Everyone got along. It's like, I'm really thankful for that. But it was like so, it was so hard. Yeah. Uh, It was so hard. And it was, you know, that month leading up to the film and the month of the film, it just feels like the hardest I've worked in my entire life. Um, So... It's not easy. Making films is not an easy thing. <laughs> it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all, especially especially just the more, you know, the more actors you have, the more locations yeah. you have, the more anytime you add a a dimension, it just creates more work and it costs more money. So, yeah, the the budget for this film was bigger than our first feature film. Uh, so we're dealing with with more money and so I think a, a, almost a time of healing <laughs> was required after production yeah. to stabilize the company financially and kind of get back into a groove with the video production stuff, um, but also just to have some separation from the project so that it could sit and we could yeah. be re-inspired to uh, get back into it. Yeah. Uh, I feel that way. I'm not going to speak for Andrew. I hope he is feeling re-inspired to get back into it from the editing standpoint. I think he does. I, I saw him cause we were shooting uh, a little video project and I was like, so have you started editing? He was like, no. And I was like, that's probably good. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> just take a little bit of time off. Yeah. Uh, as long as it gets done at some point. I do like, <laughs> right. I literally like there's uh, my, someone at Biola at my old film school, 
uh, shot a feature film and I think it was maybe like 2015, 2014. It was like January of 2015. And to this day, the, that film is not done. Um, the fact that they spent like, and their budget was not even, it was higher than yours. Yeah. Um, and the thing, I think the thing looks good. I mean, they used the reds and they had the whole yeah. film school backing them. And to this day, like, I think they're still asking money for product for post. Um, I just think that's a little bit ridiculous. I feel like no, yeah. that's that is not happening. You know, at yeah. some point the producer hat comes on, and yeah. I'm like, uh, do we need to hire someone to edit this? Or I, you know, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's Andrew's it's it's Andrew's baby. Uh, it's definitely our film. You know, just in terms of how we approached it and mm-hmm. um, divided up the work. But he is the pri- the primary writer and director, and you know, he's got a. Mm-hmm dig up the oomph to to get it done or we'll we'll figure out a way to get it done but yeah this like waiting for multiple years that is not Mm. it's not happening i can't roll like that (laughs) so boring (laughs) okay so last question would be for the next feature are you going up in budget or down in budget i think down in budget really what's what why is that um not that i disagree with it like i think yeah you you can always do either, and I feel like with me, my my budget was super low, and I have like I'm writing like two scripts right now, and one is higher and one is lower. Yeah, it's just very tempting to go to the lower side for a little bit, you know. And we have similar similar concepts where one of the films is a higher budget, and one of the films would be a lower budget. Um, just ideas, you know, nothing is written yet. And I just kind of feel like the it's it's kind of like the I I want to get another feature under our belt before going to the even higher budget because you never really know and and oh that's almost to me more of a distribution strategy mm-hmm. than like a production strategy you, you never know which film is gonna resonate or find oh. an audience mm. or you know it could be the thousand dollar thing that you made in your backyard you know it could that could be the one versus the hundred thousand dollar thing that you poured your life into and planned for years and so i i think it's like having more content to the brand uh and since it would be easier to produce something that is lower budget less locations less talent you know just less 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 shorter shoot schedule all that kind of stuff but it could still look and sound great, and hopefully the story is there and the acting is there. Um, that could be the film that takes your production company brand mm-hmm. to the to the next level, um, and more experience, opportunity to work with a team, meet new people who may be helpful on the on the larger film. So, yeah, I think it's something to be said for thinking in both ways, you know, like how do we, how do we grow? How do we do tell stories that are more complex and require more money because Mm -hmm. of that? And then how do we keep our, how do we keep our indiness for lack of a better term? How do we stay scrappy and stay uh, in that mindset of let's write for what we have, write for what we can produce, Mm -hmm. write for the space we're in uh, and pump it out in 10 days or you know whatever yeah i feel like even looking at it as a consumer the the budget is completely irrelevant you know like it doesn't matter totally where you you know bust your butt to raise uh like six digits or whatever um versus like you know doing it for like a thousand dollars because i I think at the end of the day it really comes down to the film Mm -hmm. um and i think with that budget range the quality of like a you know, like a ten thousand dollar feature and a hundred thousand dollar feature is not that different. Like it's not you're not bringing the grip truck yet. You know, just because you have such a small budget. Right. So it's like, if the story is king, why don't we write something that we can really pump out, but really focus on the story? Yeah. Uh, and I feel like I feel like that might be where I'm at right now. Where hey, let's write something that's really doable. And I feel like, again, because you have so many restrictions, you know, if you say you're going to make a film in your backyard, 
your your mind starts pumping ideas so much faster because again it's a backyard like you have to figure out exactly what it's going to be and i feel like it, it could almost make it better uh, and it, it restricts you from bringing like a crazy amount of production into it mm -hmm. yeah money money is is an out sometimes you know it's like well we could just add this and you know it'll cost x amount but it makes this writing it makes writing this moment easier Whereas maybe what you really need is more restrictions mm -hmm. to really force your creativity to come out to play. Um, you know, and every writer talks about that, having guardrails, having a sandbox to play in. And you can't go out of the sandbox. You have to use the toys that are in there. You have to use the sand that's in there. So, yeah, I think that's a huge part of what the space that we're in and what we're trying to do is keeping story at the forefront and always trying to get better at doing that, trying to get better at telling stories and writing stories and using those restraints as a positive rather than, rather than as a negative. Cool. Well, thanks for doing this. You're the first yeah, of man. many. I'm trying to get a lot of filmmakers in awesome. here to kind of speak into this and uh, just really get people to make films. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the, you know, you talked about ten thousand versus a hundred thousand dollars. You know, it's it's no secret that the total democratization of filmmaking is at hand. It's like the the technology is there for things to look and sound really good and not cost that much. Yep. So you know, part of that is now there's a huge influx of content, and right. Sundance is getting <laughs> is it like fourteen, fifteen thousand? It's something crazy. It's like yeah. out of control. So it's this weird thing of like, oh, now you can actually make something, but the chances of it rising to the top are are more slim. But the micro budget indie space is not the only space dealing with that. You know, mm -hmm. Hollywood is having the same problem where it's like the value of their products because of streaming <laughs> services is plummeting. You know, mm -hmm. a movie is no longer a ten dollar DVD or a twenty dollar Blu-ray or a Seven ninety nine iTunes rental or purchase. Now it's bundled in. So many of them are bundled into your ten bucks a month. It's just like, what the the whole? It's a bubble that's going to burst. You know, the whole thing is just like imploding. And I would rather be on the sidelines like we are, mm -hmm. and kind of like we're not on the field. You know, we're right. kind of like off in the we're off in the uh, in the batting cages warming up and kind of like getting ready to play. Yeah. But at some point, everyone on the field is just going to, like, die and something's explode. Gonna happen. And something's, something's going to happen. happen. And I want to be there with, like, hey, we made five films mm. at this price. Like, yeah. come on. So yeah. rather it, it, than, like, I can make a movie even though we haven't made one, you know? Yeah. No, you have to. Yeah, you have to have that real, I guess. not. A, it's not real, but uh, those films under your belt. And, yeah, the industry is so weird right now where... Uh, I don't know if you heard about this stripper. Oh, yeah. Um, and Tug. So, and Tug. Uh, all oh, these, yeah, it's a disaster. <laughs> all, all these companies that were supposed to be for the filmmakers who had barely anything to do. Like, their job was so simple. And, I know. and now filmmakers are getting screwed up. And uh, the whole shifting of the internet you know, versus going to theater. I, I just feel like everything is... I'm in a room where everything is floating and I'm just waiting to see where everything is going to land. Yep. Um, but in the meantime, make something right. I mean, I think the, again, if you keep your budget low, the ROI is so much like you can always make money, uh, if you keep your budget as low as possible. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you feel like you're not confident where the industry is, just know that if you don't spend that much money and you get a film at the end, um, I think you're going to come out the winning end yeah. because I mean, how could, how could you lose uh, right. if you keep that formula uh, like that? So, all right, man, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for coming and, and doing this. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you do all the YouTube things. You subscribe, like comment and share with someone who you think will benefit from this information. Additionally, if you are looking to make your first film, but you don't know where to start, I have a little course uh, where I go through everything from getting an idea all the way through post-production and finishing your project. So make sure you check that out. I'll leave the link down below. Thank you.